chair. Here's another chair. Here's another chair. No, no, no. Okay, who would like to ask a question? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Questions? Um, I have a question for Susan. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of tools that you showed out there uh, that you showed seemed quite uh, multidisciplinary in that there were a lot of 3D stuff, there were a lot of um, weird geospatial and architectural mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, is, is, is that because who the, the people who did it were sort of students? Um, and is there sort of a core set of um, tools or skills that uh, maintains throughout the different projects? Uh, yeah, thank you for asking that question, and I should have mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, it comes out of the Center for Research Architecture, so we're, a, we're an educational program within Goldsmiths, within Department of Visual Cultures, but specifically, it's called Research Architecture, and the, this project is also located in that center, and we, what we do is we bring architectural intelligence to look, uh, and we use architectural intelligence to analyze uh, in particular, human rights conflicts, um, human rights violations, urban conflict, um, civil war, ethnic, um, you know, ethnic conflict, etc. So it's about mobilizing architectural intelligence, which if you work with a group of, um, say, 20 uh, students today, and we have a variety, there are artists, there's architects, political activists, um, filmmakers, sound artists, so there's a real... Uh, combination of skills, but most of these uh, students would have certain 3D uh, digital modeling skills. So um, every project that we do requires a kind of combination of those things that come together. So for example, for a recent uh, uh, Gaza investigation, one of our students who works in uh, forensic listening, he, and he looks at the ways in which um, asylum seekers that come to the UK have to have a voice uh, print take, basically a voice recording is taken. His name is Lawrence Abu Hamdan, and he's a, he's a visual artist, but, um, and his work deals with the way in which sound has become a mechanism of policing. Um, but in this case, for the Gaza investigation, he was able to use his uh, digital acoustic skills to analyze a, a set of sort of um, uh, gunshots, if you will. So there's a way in which the skill set that students have that come into the program, I would say, is redirected in very kind of innovative ways, but it is, in effect, a, a wide range of skills. Um, so uh, Stefan Kramer is a filmmaker. He, he is the person who edited the, the drone videos, etc. So it really varies whoever arrives in our program in a given year, and we really... Um, we work very hard with all of the students to um, to run workshops, etc. So this week, our whole uh, the whole week was dedicated to remote sensing, training in GIS, things like that. So this is the kind of thing that we do within the context of their postgraduate studies. Next question. <clears throat> Thanks. One for Paul, primarily. Um, Thinking back to 2003, when some of the journalists were saying that satellite phones were potential targets for the US military if they didn't want you to report something, you didn't just have to be <coughs> Osama bin Laden. And looking back to your video in Syria, how, how do you know, what, in terms of assessing your potential adversary, uh, whether they have the capability to intercept satellite phone signals and or whether they only have the capability to intercept mobile phone signals, bearing in mind you can't afford to get it wrong? And is it just, if they're not US allies, they won't have access to that, or if they're a Russian ally, does it have the technology? How do you make those kind of calls? Get on call. Oh, I have my microphone again. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, um, it all depends on the situation, so you have to gather information beforehand on the internet and the usual channels. But in Syria, particularly, I was, I was like with a group of 15 people, Three of them were former Muhabarat Secret Service guys, so they had inside knowledge of, of what kind of devices were dangerous or not. So, yeah, like, 
the, I think certain satellite phones were okay. Uh, I don't remember the brand now, but uh, they like they knew that uh, telephones were no good. <laughs> uh, this is primarily for Paul again. Um, so I found it really interesting when you pointed out in Syria that kind of the internet and telecommunications was both a tool of state power. You know, you had to be very careful with your phone, but also a tool that empowered individuals and small groups. Like, um, you know, the reason these guys were risking serious efforts to get on the internet was to communicate their story. And I guess I was curious as to what you think the future holds. Is internet and technology going to be, you know, which of these will grow faster, the power of individuals or the power of states? Like, where do you think the future holds? <laughs> Let me think if I have a vision. <laughs> no, I, 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 my, 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 my choice, uh, my favorite choice would be the people's, but uh, I'm I, not sure. Um, I can only share uh, one memory with you. Uh, it's, uh, I went to villages uh, in northern Syria where they were sending, feeding the internet with, uh, with footage through two rayas because there was no internet, the regime had cut the internet. And uh, the only, the regime would cut the electricity also, uh, the only house that had a generator was the media center of this little village. So every time the electricity was down, brrr, you had the diesel generator uh, taking up and, and, and sending, so to be sure to send images. So. Uh, I believe that it's the new battlefield. That's why what was uh, talking about in those three days was really important and, and the, the two, I don't even know if now you can separate the universe of the hackers or the hacktivists with, the, with those of, of journalists. I think uh, basically uh, we're just evolving in the same uh, perspective. But then the technicalities of, of, of suppression and monitoring are, are progressing very fast also. I think actually this panel also shows there is a second battlefield on imagination. And uh, if we can imagine that we can do something, which is your video, David, or if we can understand you know, what happened in the Mediterranean with a map, um, or when you can make truth that wasn't there before to see, you can make it visible, um, and you are in the mountains. Eh? So, but it remains, of course, very much the question, how do we approach the imagination of people? Can you comment on that? Well, Just to keep it one, th one thing that, that Paul uh, didn't talk about is that the people he filmed, he, he showed, the activists, the hackers, he showed why higher value targets than the people who had real arms for the Syrian uh, army. And this, show, and this was filmed before Snowden. And I think there's a before and after Snowden. And um, let me explain it differently. Before Snowden, when I tried to explain to normal people what is the uh, Syrian state, what are Syrian technologies, a lot of ordinary people looked at me as, uh, as if I was paranoid. Paranoid or parano paranoia? Paranoid, paranoid. 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 Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the problem after Snowden is that most of the ordinary people and most of the people are really paranoid. And that's a real problem. Um, uh, they, are, they imagine, they believe. Um, I made several articles. Uh, I'm blogger at Le Monde, the French uh, newspaper. And I made uh, three fact-checking of what Le Monde published on his cover, explaining to my readers that Le Monde um, has failed. They believed that the NSA was able to uh, tap and spy on um, phone conversation of French. It was not the NSA that was spying on French telecommunication in France. It was the French secret services that spied some metadata abroad in Afghanistan and shared them to uh, the NSA. 
But when Le Monde uh, saw the, the document with the word NSA, the word France, and the word uh, 70 million of uh, interceptions, the journalists imagine logically that it was uh, 70 million telecommunication spied by the NSA in France. So I think it's really good now to have all this debate uh, post Snowden about what is the state surveillance, what is privacy, what is liberty, what is freedom. But uh, I'm, um, it, it, it's a shame to see all those people turning uh, paranoid and uh, trying to figure or, or imagining that uh, GCHQ, NSA, etc., are supermen. They are not supermen. Uh, they are con more or less controlled by politicians. Uh, they have to be more transparent. And uh, the more the Snowden ducks are uh, exposed, the more we see that they are not supermen. They can't uh, listen to everything every time. And um, so I think we must not only focus on imagination, but really, really, really focus on facts. And uh, look if it's facts or if it's imagination. Okay. okay. David, you want to say something? Um, in my case, I think that it's uh, a little bit different because uh, I decide to make the portrait of three, three men and uh, probably there'll be someone that would say, who are them? Maybe I will write their name down the, 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 the chair. But I think that uh, art has the possibility to help people to uh, ask to themselves something about their life. Uh, my sculptures, I think it's very clear and directly, straight to the point. And people could say, who are them? Why they are standing? Uh, why there's a, an empty chair? Maybe it's for me. I don't know. I think that, I think that it is the part of the imagination in my, in my work. And for you, Paul? I, I, I just, I think there's, again, an example I wanted to share with people who are here. There's, Northern Syria is very much affected not only by the attacks of the regime, but also by the Islamic State, as you all know. And it's a really sad thing. Um, but there's a village, a bit like Asterix for those who know. There's a village that is resisting. It's, it's called Kafran Bell. Uh, and uh, every week, Raid Faraz from Kafran Bell sends a piece of theater uh, through the internet. Um, I mean, sometimes it's a bit naive, but it's art. I mean, uh, it's it's not it's not political statement. It's it is also a political statement, but it's it takes the shape of a little theater scene, and uh, it's it means a lot. It means uh, it means that they didn't fall to the to the Islamic State. It means they're still resisting the regime. They try to make us feel guilty. Usually, that's that's awakening the conscience, as you say. Um, and it's interesting to know that in the middle of this, this ocean of, 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 of um, yeah, extremism, because that's what the Islamic State is, there is a village where they use the internet and art as a weapon of resistance in the middle of the chaos and in the middle of the war. You can go check it out on, on Facebook. It's called Kafran Bell, K-A-F-R-A-N-B-E-L. It's the name of the village, and uh, so far they've been resisting to a lot of heavy things. True heart. Beautiful, thank you. Susan, to closer um, session. I would answer that in two ways. First of all, for myself, I would, to me, the fundamental definition of politics is to imagine a different reality than the one you have. So from the get-go, the political for me is absolutely an aesthetic kind of project. It must be understood in those terms, and that's the terms by which I would operate as an artist. But within the, within, if I refer to some of the materials I showed, I think it does take a certain act of imagination to look at the sea, this, liquid, this, this sort of liquid geography that in fact has the capacity to hide the traces of the crime and to insist that that actually could be read in the same way that we might read sort of terrestrial space and not simply capitulate to, to situations where people are telling you there's nothing more that we can know about something. There's always something more, but it, it requires a certain kind of, I think, imagination to start putting very disparate pieces of information together to construct some sort of whole 
That was the same with the, uh, the, uh, the, way the UN uh, drone strike inquiry and the why, why since the first drones were launched in 2004, and, I mean, despite the obvious sort of UN veto powers, why there was such a kind of dragging of heels to some degree had to do with the response, and this was a constant refrain, oh, there's nothing, we don't have enough information to proceed. So part of the work that we were doing always was to insist that abs there is information there and, we, and, and it can be uh, brought into a certain amount of visibility, but it requires a kind of high degree of innovation in terms of how one starts to put things that are basically in the public domain oftentimes together to, to start to create an image where none seems to exist and the absence of that image becomes uh, the reason that states give for kind of lack of action. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we have a tea break. Quarter past three, we have the final debate on building the alliance. And this panel, if you like to, sorry? Yeah, I'm going to do it now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good I have to announce things, you know. Uh, so, half an hour we meet each other here for tea, Qu quarter past three for building the alliance. This panel will be at New Speaks Live, so if you like to continue conversation with them, you can go there. And there's one more final request. I announced it yesterday. Uh, there's a, a, a forum in your conference bag with the questionnaire on enc encryp encryption made by the Holland Foundation and CIJ. And will you please fill that in and give it uh, to us in the box at the reception desk, because it informs what you like to do as next. Yeah? And, and here's